Hi there guys, it's Mike from MCQ Bushcraft here and welcome to another video. Hopefully you can hear me above the high tides at the moment. The ocean's pretty fierce today and it's making a lot of noise. But in this video here I really wanted to show you some of the items that I carry around really in this basket here. I collect a lot of natural items and uh, it's something I've always done since the age of about 12. And this basket here is really a, a fairly posh basket. For those of you who are in the know, you're probably having a look at the front and seeing the F and M on the front there, and that stands for Fortnum and Mason, and they're a company that produce very expensive hampers. A lot of you are probably thinking, wow, Mike's got a lot of money, but that's really not the case. I was actually doing some gardening for a friend, cutting some hedge trimmings and things and doing the lawn, and I went to the recycling centre and saw some guy take this out the back of his car and just chuck it straight into a skip. And I thought, I'm not letting that opportunity go to waste. So I ran over to the guy at the recycling centre and said, uh, can I have that basket? And the guy who managed the place said, yes, you can, but you can't climb in the skip because it's too dangerous. If you can fish it out, then you can have it. And I had lots of long branches, so I managed to get one round this rope handle here. There's one on either side and actually fish the basket out. It was empty at the time, so it wasn't particularly heavy. It is made really well. It's got rope handles either side that are woven in really nicely, brass buckles and leather straps at the front, and it's even got pigskin hinges at the back. But enough about the basket, let's have a look inside it and I'll show you some of the items that I've collected. So I've got a whole range of things in here, and we'll uh, have a look at some of the skulls I've collected. This isn't all of the skulls that I own, but these are just some of the nicest ones that I like to hang on to. Most of these species here are deer, as you can see with the antlers, uh, although some are non-native species that we have over here in the British Isles, and others have deformities in the horns, which we can talk about a bit later. But there are other bones in here and tusks and things from wild boar from the Forest of Dean. But we have a nice skull here, and this is a badger, and you can tell it's a badger. The bottom jaw is locked in, which is quite typical when you find badger skulls. And you have this ridge along the back of the skull there. We have other skulls here as well. This is a muntjac, which is a type of deer, which is basically an introduced deer here in the British Isles. This one's fairly weathered. You can see it's not bleached particularly well by the sun, and that was because it was found under the canopy in woodland. But it's a, a rather nice skull, actually. We have another muntjac skull here. You can see this one's been bleached by the sun. And you can see a deformity in these antlers. It could be for a number of reasons. It could be through fighting, or it might have been that it just got damaged on barbed wire or something like that. It could also be damaged to the testicles of the actual muntjac, which kind of creates an irregular growth. But it's nice when they get bleached by the sun. You can induce this with bleach, and you can boil them as well, and get the whiteness to come out of them a bit more. But that's another muntjac there. We have a, a roe deer here, and this is a really nice uh, skull, missing a lot of the front end around the nose, unfortunately, but that is a particularly fragile part of the skull. This one's got quite a lot of teeth on it, which is nice, and uh, we have a deformity as well. Look at that, that antler there. It's, um, it's really deformed. This one's really quite nice and normal, quite a substantial antler. Whereas this one has really taken on a strange form. It's a shame it doesn't have the tip of this portion here or at the back, it's been broken off. But again, could be testicular damage, could be maybe even some sort of health issue or damage from barbed wire or just it damaging itself by accident. We've got a really old boy just here for a uh, for a roe deer that's um, a pretty impressive set of antlers there and uh, some of these antlers I cut off off the least impressive skulls or sometimes I get given heads with all the flesh on I don't really want to wait for the flesh to come off but also parts have been cut off for keychains and fire steels and to make other sorts of things we do have another row here which has got you know a good age really got some perfectly intact antlers quite a nice skull got all his teeth and uh, the front portion of the actual skull is in good condition so that's a really nice find from just the local nature reserve by me as well. I think some people can find it quite morbid the collection of skulls or keeping skulls in your home or something like that but uh, for me I actually just find them fascinating they don't represent death to me 
I don't think about death when I look at skulls. I actually just find them quite incredible and it just really shows that you know the complexities of nature uh, things that people don't normally think about in everyday life. I've got a horse's skull and a bull's skull at home uh, obviously too big to just lug around in a basket like this but I mean they're um, really heavy duty uh, quite quite impressive really but it's the smaller ones that I've always quite liked to um, have a look at and take to shows and things. I think kids especially have always expressed a real interest when they come up to like a stall and they see all these things hanging up. Um, I did a medieval fair in a local village not long ago and you know the kids really uh, find it just fascinating all of the skulls they're sort of just processing the information and just exploring having a look at these things so it's something I've always had a, a real keen interest in. But let's have a look at what else we have. I have some feathers here. I don't have too many feathers. I do have a few from different species. But this is from a tawny owl. Um, I put it on Instagram a little while back. I found a dead tawny owl on a fungus foray in the Forest of Dean. And I stripped some of the feathers off of it because I'd never really held a dead tawny owl before. And um, I think it just died of natural causes, really. It just, just looked absolutely fine, but no sign of it being shot or anything or maimed. It was just on the ground, and uh, I think it was just the end of its life. But some really nice feathers from a tawny owl, and the others are non-native. They're from a pheasant. These are the tail feathers and some of the wing feathers of a pheasant, a male. But these are really the only feathers I have, and I imagine at some point I'll need some more because I intend to make quite a bit out of them. One activity you may see me do a fair bit is hunt, and as a result I end up with quite a lot of hides, and these are from rabbit, again a non-native species in the British Isles, but uh, something that's almost everywhere now. Some of these have been prepared, I've brain tanned them or used various solutions, um, others, like this one here, haven't been tanned yet. This is just rawhide and it's waiting to be tanned. I haven't had a chance to do it yet. But as a result, I've ended up with quite a few rabbit hides. I don't do a tremendous amount of hunting, but when I do, these days, I quite like to hang on to the hides. I don't always hang on to the hides, obviously. You've seen videos of me out doing coastal survival and hunting and throwing the hides away, but it just depends on the circumstance. These are all from rabbit. I do have some squirrel and some deer, including muntjac. I don't actually have those in the basket. I'm not sure where they are. I think I've left them at home somewhere else. But this one here is a brain tanned hide, um, finished off with a pumice stone. It was mauled by a dog. You can see where it sort of got bit and the holes have expanded through stretching. That's just something that, that happens really. But it's turned out really nice and it's very supple. It could be even more supple if I wanted it to be, but I tend to get mine to a usable state and I'm not too fussed about them being really, really floppy and supple. Um, I just prefer them like this really, because they retain a little bit more strength, especially with a thin hide, and that's why I'm saying this. Rabbit hides are really thin. With a deer, you can get it much softer than this, but really warm and you can make things out of these. We have other ones here as well. These ones are finished with a solution, but this one is rawhide. You can see that it's really cracking and making a lot of noise. It's been fleshed and it's been cured with salt, so it will last like this forever really, unless it gets really wet and remains wet and then it will rot. Um, a lot of these hides, I mean this one's been smoked, which is why it's taken on a bit of a colour and that helps repel water, but it certainly doesn't make it completely waterproof. In fact, it would need to be smoked tremendously to actually make it completely waterproof. But this one here really needs finishing off and it can be finished off with brain, it can be finished off with egg, or it can be finished off with an actual tanning solution that you would buy. So this one here is uh, a waiting to be tanned and it'll be the fourth of the rabbit hides that I've got. And the reason being that I've got four is I'm gonna make a winter hat and uh, I want more rabbit hides from the rabbits that I'm gonna hunt anyway um, to actually make a nice hat with. Other hides that I have in here are much larger. And um, this is again a commercially tanned hide and this is reindeer. I actually have two reindeer hides, neither of which I've tanned myself. 
but uh, I think the climate's a little bit too warm for reindeer hides over here. You get a lot of molting when the weather gets warmer with reindeer hide and when it starts to molt it's incredibly hard to stop. They're generally okay for the first couple of years and then people start storing them in their homes and they literally just molt all the time. I mean the one below is, is terrible. The, the fur just goes everywhere so I generally keep them rolled up and in here and I use them for various things. I've slept on them before, super warm, put them in my sleeping bag and underneath and it was um, a very very warm night in what were minus conditions and um, they're really useful but they're very nice. I mean I could literally just soak them in water, let the hair slip, refinish them and just have suede or just have thin leather and actually make something out of it and I may do that with one of them but I like to keep one for displays and things for doing shows for teaching bushcraft just to give people an idea of what a larger hide is like but one of these I think it was this one at the bottom here £10 got it for uh, it was given to me for Christmas actually for £10 it cost someone they just took it to a charity shop they didn't want it anymore probably because it was molting it was driving them mad and uh, they, they put it in there and it was sold for £10. They cost hundreds, it cost about £120 to buy a reindeer hide. The other one was given to me, I did a medieval show in a village and uh, I had one reindeer hide hanging up and they said would you like two more? And I said yeah of course and uh, I went round their house after the medieval show a few days later and they gave me two more reindeer hides and uh, I was very grateful and offered to teach their son and, and daughter bushcraft at some point so I really should get in touch with them in the future but uh, yeah got some nice hides out of that really and um, they are they are quite useful. I have other items in here that are fairly basic I have um, this is made of dog rose this is a bow for a bow drill kit it's one I use for demos and things it's not a particularly plush item it's got paracord as, the, as this piece of cord here and funnily enough this piece of cord has done hundreds of bow drill fires and it's never been changed and the reason being is it's infused with wax beeswax I always put beeswax on my cord and it literally stops it fraying almost like a bow string that you would find on a recurve bow compound bow crossbow putting a bit of wax on them really does help the bow drill kits are here I've got a few different types of wood. I did have a huge selection but it just takes too much to carry them all around. Uh, but this is ivy and poplar, uh, two uh, pretty good woods really but more exhibition woods and what I mean by that is you use them as a fail safe when you do shows rather than struggle because you know it keeps the audience interested and it all happens really quickly. Uh, they're not woods that you just commonly find deadfall from out in the actual wilderness or the natural landscape of the British Isles but uh, quite useful anyway and the spindle or the drill is hazel a piece of dead hazel that I found that was off the ground it was just at that stage of its life where it wasn't rotten enough to be punky because it seriously goes off quickly hazel it's not ideal for drills if you expect to just find them intact a lot of the time um, but one really interesting item that I have, or two items, is this. This is a bracket fungus and this is native to the British Isles. It's a really nice one and I really wanted to uh, use this as an exhibition piece because it's uh, a beautiful bracket fungi. But I have another one in here as well that I brought back from Norway, or another two actually. This one here and another one there which is the, the layer from the inside of it. Um, a bracket fungi is, is one that looks basically like a bracket, it grows off of a, a trunk like that and you can break them off if you wish to, a lot of them can be fairly parasitic not that breaking them off saves the tree because it's well within there no matter what you do but they are nice to find and interesting to look at and they've had many uses and this one here is called Foams Fomentarius, I got this from Norway, you may find it up north in Scotland as well uh, but mainly it, it grows in colder climates in the northern hemisphere. I found a part of the River Wye that has them too, um, just down from Hereford funnily enough. But you can use this as an ember, I mean I, I collected this because I've been looking for this particular bracket fungi for years and reading about it, studying bushcraft and suddenly I found it whilst out in the wilderness in Norway up in the mountains and I was over the moon and I decided to make amadou out of it and I made quite a lot of amadou on my trip into Norway using the trauma layer just here and that's really what it looks like 
if you cut it out of the bracket fungi, which is what I did when I was away. It can be used as it is like that. It can be charred and used with a flint and steel. It can be used with a flint and steel without charring it, but it's much more challenging and it takes a bit of preparation. Even used with iron parietes and flint, naturally occurring iron and flint, but again, more challenging, takes more preparation because you're working with a colder spark, so conditions need to be a bit more ideal. It can be burnt just like this. Put this on a fire, it will smolder and it will glow for a very, very long time if managed properly. But that isn't a very big bracket fungi, as you can see, but a particularly nice one. But this one we have here, this is Ganoderma australi, massive bracket, probably about 20 years old, an enormous bracket. And you can make an amadou material out of that as well. This is what they often call this material, although it would be a lot softer than this. It would literally be like the hides we looked at, really floppy and malleable. Uh, this has not been treated yet, so it's really just for demo purposes to show people what the layer looks like. But this has layers in it as well. In fact, you can see this darker layer and it can be taken out with a bit more um, work given the size of this bracket and actually turned into like a poor man's amadou. That's what I always called it anyway. Like a substitute amadou, not quite as good. But again, this whole bracket can be burnt and it will last for days. You could probably keep this smouldering for a week if you managed it properly. And to carry fire, which many sort of native peoples did years ago, or primitive peoples, it would have been a very, very useful method of carrying fire. This is too nice to burn, really. It's a beautiful specimen and one that I like to show people and they often don't think it's from the UK. They say, oh, where's that from? Some tropical environment. Nope. It's from about two miles from where you live and uh, it's a, a really nice one. We're losing a lot of daylight, so I'll pick up the pace a little bit. But you've seen most of the items that are in this kit. Probably the only thing I haven't really shown you is quite a few of the spoons in, in here that I've carved. We have other tools as well. I have my Granfus Brooks wildlife hatchet, which I use for carving, a Baco Laplander. Mainly a lot of the items in here are just for show and tell, just to show different types of knives. I've got a, a Mora Reba uh, sorry, a Mora Heavy Duty and another Mora knife there, just to show that you can buy affordable cheap knives that actually perform really well. Um, got other things in here as well, like a whetstone, a strop for spoon knives that are curved, as you can see just there, and the strop part actually comes off and reveals a ceramic um, stone as well, so you can actually take away more material if you find that the strop isn't doing the job. So there's really a little bit more in there. There's not too much really, just odds and ends. I actually got a beach stone here, which is quite good for an ax puck as well. I'll show you that too. But other than that, the only thing in there is a shell that I found when I was scuba diving in Cyprus. I quite like the look of it and swam down and picked it up. But again, that's just really in there, uh, just as a show and tell. It's not something that I I'm not big on collecting shells, if I'm completely honest. I'm more into the, the skulls and bones than I am the shells, but thought it was a nice one anyway. Something to remember the holiday by. We've got a variety of things in here. I showed you the strop for the spoon knives, and that's for hooked knives, so a little bit like this scorp here, you can see there. It'd be very useful. You put this through and, and then angle back, through like that, angle back. You can obviously strop the outside as well on a normal strop, but if something's a little bit too tricky, you take that off and you have the ceramic part. So that's just a strop for spoon knives. And we have a DC4 there. I don't use that much anymore. In fact, the only thing I use it for is for flattening off the whetstone, making sure I have a flat surface before I actually sharpen on it. So really that can go with that. It's my finishing stone for the actual whetstone. This is a king whetstone by the way, I've shown that in various videos and if you look in the description of this video you'll see a lot of links to videos that will relate to this video as well. So there's some tools there for honing and we have a puck for the axe which is just a beach stone. It actually works very well and it was quite a nice little find. There are loads of them on the beach and they're very easy to actually use. So we have a few items there. I have my Granfalls Brooks Wildlife hatchet, which I use for carving with. Very nice little carving axe. Probably see it in the older videos. Lightweight axe, very useful to use, but I carry a bigger one there because it's just much more useful for splitting. 
few tools knocking about. Got my prototype field master, as you've probably seen in previous videos, still going strong. I've got a jacklaw wasp just there. This is actually Zed's. I'm doing a bit of work on the sheath for him. You can see a nice jacklaw wasp with a Scandi grind, 01 tool steel. Very nice. Got an awl, which is useful for making holes in the back of the spoons if you actually want to hang them up with a bit of cord. Got my scorp. This is basically a gouging tool for creating spoons and a really nice one. Very rigid because it's mounted on both sides. It's great for putting some power down and getting material out. So these are really just the tools I've got in here. This is a jack law. This is a three mil with a 25 degree bevel. It's a beautiful knife with a beautiful sheath. Um, really nice. And some red liners, red stitching on the sheath. Very nice combination. I really like that knife. I do have another one as well, which is you. This is the first one he made me. This is a four mil with a slightly thicker bevel. I can't remember how thick, maybe 28 degrees. All my O1 tool steel blades are oiled when they're in the sheath. So they've always got quite a lot of oil on them. That is quite important. But this is um, English U, very beautiful wood. And uh, this is slightly thicker, a bit more robust knife, but I prefer the, th the three mil with a 25 degree bevel, much, uh, much more responsive. And I have another three mil with a 25 degree bevel. And this is a forest bushcraft forest knife. Very nice with some curly birch. And uh, again, very, very nice knife, quite rounded, good for chest lever, quite a steep point on it, so you get a bit of rotation in the wood. Quite nice as a substitute knife if you like, you know, using a field knife but doing a bit of carving. And these are some of the spoon carving tools I use along with various other general knives. But really the spoons, they're not all mine. A lot of the spoons I've made I've gifted away, so unfortunately I don't have too many. We've got a variety of spoons, this is just one I've made out of hazel with an antler tang and some pine pitch, just a bit of a combination, but the actual curve and crank of the spoon isn't quite right, it really should be facing up this way, a little more ergonomical, but it works quite nice and it was just something I rescued. Got one made of birch there, too thin a neck on it, went a bit over the top, but you just need to know when to stop with these things. This is one made for me by Moleskin Joe, it's a spork as you can see. Very nice. That one there is by John Mack when I went to stay with him for a while and do some carving. And that one there is by Lee Stoffer. This is Rowan. You can see the two-tone there. Very nice. Little yoghurt spoon. And I was given that one by an apprentice who um, spent some time with me teaching with me or, or I was sort of helping him out. Um, he was being an apprentice on some courses, a very young lad. And he made this out of you. English yew that you found in a woodland uh, fallen over. So some nice spoons there. And you've got a whole range of them really. This one I brought back from Cyprus. I think this is made of olive wood. It's very very nice. Very old and that's why I quite liked it. An old spoon. Again this one's made of cherry, gifted to me by a friend who spent a long time making it out of a cherry tree cut down in his allotment. And uh, yeah, quite a nice soup spoon that one, quite like it. This one I made on a, a video, as you probably see in the description when I went to see John Mack. This is made of alder, alder is probably my favourite wood for carving with at the moment. Very, very beautiful wood. And we've got another spoon I quite like that I made out of cherry. Uh, that's my favourite one and that's a, a salad spoon. And um, yeah, very nice. So I won't go into too much detail over the spoons, most of them are a gift away. I gave quite a few spoons away at Christmas actually. I spent a lot of time carving and making things and giving people gifts but carving to me is really just sort of like an extension of knife skills and you know you know how to carve it teaches you about wood, teaches you about wood grain and you learn an awful lot from that experience. Well I hope you enjoyed this video I really just wanted to show you some of the natural items and some of the crafts that I make. There are a lot more things that I, I own and make and things that I find, mostly leather work and parts of my kit, which I'll show you in later videos. But a lot of the things you've seen we will cover in future videos, things like spoon carving, various types of bracket fungi, definitely hide tanning, um, carving and sharpening tools. There are lots of things coming up on the channel this year. I thought it'd just be nice to share with you the kind of things that I like to collect when I'm out in the field and I come across a bit of a treasure 
that nature has to offer. We're losing light though. The tide's finally going out and it's quietened down. I've actually got some um, trot lines out, so I'm gonna go check them, see whether I've got anything for dinner. But I'll see you very soon in another video. Thanks again for watching guys and take care.